A woman's sister can be her closest friend. Sometimes when sisters kill, it's because they're bonded to kill for the same reason or her worst enemy. Sometimes it's because they hate each other. A little sister's greed drives her to the unthinkable. On all four walls of the room and ceiling, blood everywhere. Twins discover they are different in life. She just wanted to live her lifestyle. And in murder. And the ultimate sibling rivalry. It was like poking a stick at an angry bull. These deadly women are bound by blood and divided by the sins of the sister. For some, the sisterly bond is everlasting. No matter how you feel about her, you're raised with them. They're your blood. For others, it doesn't exist. She suffered the ultimate betrayal from her sister. July 1st, 1997. The war on drugs has reached the suburb of East Oakland, California. Two middle-aged women are taking on the local drug dealers. But soon, their surveillance comes to a fiery end. Definitely something that you don't see that much of, somebody firebombing a house. The community was outraged that here you have these two white middle-aged women being firebombed by drug dealers. But the truth is even more outrageous. For four years, 52-year-old Stevie Allman shares her home with her little sister, Sarah Mitchell. Blood ties are about all the siblings have in common. Sarah, get these people out of your now. Stevie was the exact opposite of Sarah. Stevie was a very hardworking, industrious woman. She was just a very responsible person. I wouldn't say they were real close because I think Stevie, being such a hardworking woman, didn't really care for Sarah's irresponsibility. It was almost the good sister versus the bad sister. Stevie had a good job, had a pension from her retirement. 47-year-old Sarah lives rent-free in her sister's house. I would describe her as kind of an underachiever. She was basically cared for by her sister, Stevie Allman. Far from being grateful for the free food and board, Sarah steals her sister's money and then Stevie's identity. She writes checks in her name, she invades her bank account, she uses her credit cards, and she tells people that she is Stevie. Stevie, who was loved in the community. Okay, I'll just need to check your ID, Miss Olin. Stevie Olin. Chances are, Sarah hated her sister their whole lives. The bank alerts Stevie to the fraud. After all the partying, freeloading, and now theft, she's had enough. All you do is lie and steal. I needed that money. It got to the point that where Stevie concluded money. that, look, sir, I don't plan on taking care of you for the rest of your life. Well, I want you out now. At some point, you're going to have to be responsible, go out there and get a job, and take care of yourself. You've stolen your last dollar from me. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Sarah has no intention of giving up the good life. She 
she decides her sister has to go and never come back. When Stevie confronted her, I think that Sarah got angry and decided to kill her. And Sarah knows who to pin the blame on. The sisters are well-known anti-drug crusaders. They've made enemies of the local dealers by photographing and taping their activities. She's claimed that drug dealers in the area have been trying to burn her out, and it was her against them. ...are attacked. For Sarah to keep her life on Easy Street, it is time for drastic action. This was the ultimate betrayal. The last person you would expect when you lay your head down at night to go to sleep to come and kill you is your sister. She went into the bedroom and basically beat her to death with a blunt object to the head. Stevie's skull had been crushed. Sarah killed Stevie while she was in bed asleep because she didn't want a fight on her hands, a fight that she might be injured in or could lose. But the murder is only part of Sarah's plan. Her plan was to kill her sister and assume her sister's identity and basically wipe out her bank accounts and take everything that she had. But before she can take over Stevie's life, there are a few loose ends to clean up. East Oakland, California. July 1st, 1997. 47-year-old Sarah Mitchell bludgeons her older sister Stevie to death for her money and identity. But first, she must dispose of Stevie's body. A large body in this case, uh, even an obese one, would be very, very difficult for Sarah to move on her own. Dismember it, she could relocate it piece by piece which is what she did. She dismembered her arms and legs and she dismembered her at the waist. There was blood spatter 360 degrees in the room. On all four walls of the room and the ceiling, blood everywhere. Killers dismember their victim. Sometimes it fulfills some ghoulish need. But sometimes it's for a very practical reason. Stevie's body had to be chopped up to be placed in freezer bags and put in the freezer. But there is too much bloody mess to clean up. The only way to destroy all of this blood evidence was to light that room on fire which is what she did. Made a decision to burn the whole house up. We believe that she was trying to collect the insurance money for the burned down house to destroy the freezer and the body. From out of the ashes, 
Sarah will emerge as Stevie. But there's one thing she doesn't count on. She did not anticipate getting burned in the fire, which required her to be hospitalized to treat the burn wounds. While in the hospital, Sarah maintains her story that the local drug dealers have firebombed their home. No one has any reason to doubt her, and there is outrage at the attack. It becomes a front page story, and the sisters are hailed heroines in the war against drugs. Seems you struck quite a chord with the community, Miss Allman. Just call me Stevie. Notes of sympathy and donations come flooding in. She did not think that it would become such a big story. Because, you know, when you're trying to get away with murder, you don't want notoriety and attention. The limelight is the last thing you need. When you are not who you say you are. It's unusual for people to kill someone and assume their identity. The people that pull it off for a while are usually very, very intelligent and they're highly mobile. I did not just describe Sarah. Not at all. Where her sister is. Her responses were kind of cavalier. Oh, I, Sarah will turn up. She'll call when she wants to. My gut feeling was that uh, this isn't right. While Sarah is being admired as an anti-drug crusader, investigating officer Greg Hughes looks past the flames. He asks questions around the neighborhood. This one neighbor happened to see the newsreel footage. She called me and she said, that woman that came out of the house that was put in the ambulance was not Stevie. That was Sarah. Police take a closer look at the burnt out house and find one thing that has been insulated from the flames. The deep freezer. What she didn't anticipate was that the freezer being insulated would also insulate the body from the fire. The body was in fairly decent shape other than the fact that it had been dismembered. Fingerprints confirm Sarah's true identity. After years of resentment and jealousy, Sarah Mitchell kills for greed. She tries to take everything her sister has and ends up with nothing. In February 2001, Sarah Mitchell is sentenced to life in prison person like that would have to be totally detached from their emotions. And I don't know how somebody gets to that point. I really don't. I think the most shocking aspect was the fact that Stevie Yaman being the kind of person she was, hardworking, loving, and what she got in return from her sister was being murdered and dismembered. Sarah is a sociopath to the core. Who could kill someone they're raised with, someone who is good to them? Only a sociopath could do such a thing. A woman with ambition. All she needed in life to make her happy was money for wealth and independence. She may have just hated him. She may have just wanted him out of the way. Can be. 1992, Huntsville, Alabama. Twins Betty Wilson and Peggy Lowe enjoy each other's company. They share the same gene pool, but are very different individuals. Peggy Lowe uh, sang in the choir in a big Baptist church. She was a school teacher, and she was in 
high regard in the community. Her sister Betty has a more flashy reputation. Betty lived what some would call a liberated lifestyle. It's a bit early to be drinking, isn't it? And partied quite a bit. Did anything she wanted to do. She collected things like fur coats, diamonds, jewelry. She had a pretty good collection of luxury items. A nurse, Betty is married to wealthy ophthalmologist Jack Wilson. She wanted to find a rich doctor. She was infatuated with money and with the status that a doctor could bring her. Jack is quite a catch. Look what I just got, Jack. Isn't it gorgeous? Dr. Wilson was a one-of-a-kind guy. He was a generous man. He had a sign in his office that said, if you can't pay, see the doc. All right, Simon. Let's have a look at these eyes of yours. Dr. Jack Wilson was like one of those doctors that did everything for everyone. He was a great person to be around, to have as a doctor. He was just an outstanding guy. There's no question he was one of the most beloved men in Huntsville, Alabama. Well, you've got a slight astigmatism, but I don't think you've got any glasses. Thanks, so. Doc. But this generous doctor has health problems of his own. He suffers from Crohn's disease, an inflammatory bowel disorder required him to wear a colonoscopy bag, which was very uncomfortable for him and apparently very odious to her. Betty has no sympathy. She ridicules him publicly in the most heartless way. She would say things like, you make me sick and I don't want to see you anymore. Thank you. She would do this before the personnel in Jack's office, for example. She would say things to him like, you disgust me, which probably in Jack's heart was his biggest fear, that he would ever disgust anyone. Repelled by her husband's condition, <laughs> oh, you're too much. Betty openly takes lovers. <laughs> Betty was notorious. She was very freewheeling. She was not abashed about her sexual encounters. Promiscuous would be an understatement. Come on, Jack. Come to get you a briefcase. Bye bye now. She told Jack that she was never going to have sex with him again. The one thing Betty likes about Jack is his money. I think she just wanted to live her lifestyle the way she wanted to live it. And she was quite opposite from her sister in that regard. Betty's sister Peggy lives a very different life. She's known for helping those in need. Like out of work handyman, James White. He'd been a loser all of his life. He had lost his children. He went from job to job being a workman. I'm doing very tough, actually. Peggy met James through some work that she had done at her school. She needed bookshelves for her classroom. She learned that James Dennison White was a handyman in the area. She sends him to her sister, Betty, who has a job for him. James Dennison White is and was a wretched human being. I have something I think she was very interested in. Hiring James White will propel the twins into a real-life tragedy the town will never forget. He was a drug addict. He was a liar. He was a cheater. He was a deserter. He was a whole lot of bad things. Soon, James adds one more thing to the list. Killer. Huntsville, Alabama, 19.
1992. Betty Wilson likes a good time. She's bored with her 14-year marriage to ailing husband, Jack. I think Betty married Jack Wilson for two reasons. Number one, he was an ophthalmologist, which probably meant he made a lot more money than most doctors did. Debilitating disease. She thought he would die. In May 1992, Betty and Jack's marriage comes to an abrupt end. James White was waiting for him inside. What the brain? They scuffled. James White picked up this baseball bat and meticulously beat Jack to death with it. It was a brutal murder. Get out of my house! Get Jack is left to die. They found him beaten severely and stabbed uh, at least twice. It looks like a burglary gone wrong. Until the police receive a phone call from James White's former girlfriend. The police zeroed in on James pretty quickly. They got a tip from an informant who said that she was a former girlfriend of James White and that he had talked to her in a drunken stupor about being hired to kill someone in Huntsville. After he was captured, he told a, uh, a series of uh, stories. James confesses but insists he is a contract killer. And his alleged clients will stun officials. He got around to admitting that he had been hired to commit the murder by the twin sisters. James says his instructions come not only from Betty, but her twin sister, Peggy. Said that Betty Wilson and Peggy Lowe hired him to go and kill Dr. Jack Wilson and they were going to pay him $5,000. Betty's disdain for her husband is well known. Betty Wilson was viewed as a social climber, having affairs while married to this great Dr. Jack Wilson and all of the great things that he did. Betty's reputation at the time of the murder would have been something else. It would have been a little more sinister. She had a reputation of being uh, unfaithful to her husband. Pound finds it impossible to accept Peggy as a suspect. Well, I think there were probably opposite extremes. Peggy Lowe was held, uh, I guess, uh, in, in high regard. In Vincent, Alabama, Peggy Lowe was loved. They loved her. Everyone loved her. There is no forensic evidence implicating either twin. But James's testimony and a library book checked out by Betty Wilson are enough for arrests. What the hell are you doing? Ow. They were connected by a library book which was checked out from the Huntsville Library. Ow, you are hurting me. Where Betty had actually transferred some money to him, and he still had the, the book in his car at the time he was arrested. The verdict is something only a jury can decide. James White is the star witness. He worked out a deal where he would get a reduced sentence in return for testifying against the two women. In court, as in life, the sisters are opposites. Peggy was acquitted by the jury in her case. There's absolutely no way she could have done any of this. While Peggy is found innocent, Betty is found guilty of murder.
she is sentenced to life in prison without parole. The facts that we brought together painted the picture of a vile and contemptuous woman who had everything but wanted more. Betty denies ever meeting James White and to this day proclaims her innocence. Peggy supports her sister's claims. Betty Wilson has no empathy for other people. She doesn't feel bad about hurting other people. It's hard for me as a registered nurse to say that about another registered nurse. But I do believe this to be true. Betty Wilson was a dangerous woman, and she still is. She's right where she needs to be for the rest of her life. Get more deadly women online. www.investigationdiscovery.com Of sisters fighting, especially during adolescence. But while most grow out of it, her moods were becoming unmanageable and her aggression was rising. Some don't get the chance. It's like a gun being cocked all the time and finally it goes off. There's no stopping what comes out the barrel. Australia, 2004. In the Sydney suburb of Strathfield, Kathleen and Susan Worrell are typical teenage sisters. There was sibling rivalry, but nothing more than you expect in an ordinary family. They have a loving relationship and come from a good home. Kathleen had gone to one of the best private schools in Sydney, along with Susan and she'd done quite well. She had a large group of friends. They all said that she was a lovely person. Oh, so gorgeous, both of them. So thirsty, too gorgeous, it's like She described her sister and her as two halves of the one whole, and Susan had reciprocated that love. But as the girls reach puberty, one thing sets them apart. Kathleen suffered from a hormonal disorder, wherein she had way too much testosterone and exhibited a lot of male features. Kathleen is born with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH. But when she reaches puberty, the symptoms become obvious. This would be a terrible thing for a young girl. She would have facial hair, a deep voice. She wouldn't look like a girl. She's going to look like a boy. Forensic pathologist Janice Amatuzio says the side effects of this condition are especially challenging for a young woman. When a female infant is born with this particular enzyme deficiency, what we tend to see is they have all of the developmental factors that we see in normal male development. As a result, this individual can be thought to be tall as a child, more muscular, have a deeper voice, grow facial hair, and have excess strength. From the time of birth, once this is discovered, that individual is placed on steroids for the rest of their lives. But Kathleen's medication has unwanted Movies? I'm not going. I can't go out. Look at me. Look at when me. she was on the medication she was supposed to be, it caused her to gain excessive weight. Teenage girls don't like being overweight. Kathleen hated it. I'm ready. Let's go. The side effects of Kathleen's medication were quite awful and she found very difficult to deal with. This medication is ruining my life. The pressure gets to Kathleen. She is unhappy and desperate to control her weight. Oh, 
Hello, Kathleen. Come in. How are things going? Life's too hard. I feel so fat. I want to come off the medication. I think in the state that Kathleen was in, she perhaps didn't understand the side effects of not taking medication. I don't think that's a good idea. Why not? Look at me. I'm a 20-year-old girl who looks like a gladiator. No one's going to want to touch me. Just settle down, Kathleen. Have you already come off your medication? You don't understand. No one understands. I'm trying to understand. When somebody has suddenly stopped taking steroids that they've been taking for their whole life, small things can irritate them and small things can set them off. Kathleen secretly stops taking her medication. Kathleen, dinner's almost ready. Don't go eating snacks now. Get off my back. Why are you always going on at me? The level of testosterone in Kathleen's blood rose and rose and rose to a dangerous level, to a point where it was four times as high as it should have been for a woman her age. What's wrong? You are taking your pills, aren't you? Stop telling me what to do. Everyone thinks they can tell me what to do. I've had it. Kathleen feels powerful. Testosterone is the aggression hormone. After she stopped taking the medication, she was training very obsessively. She was very pleased with herself. I think she described herself as being, you know, like a gladiator, very strong. Psychiatrist Olav Nielsen discovered how the process started to affect Kathleen's state of mind. It's a little bit similar to the people who are doing bodybuilding, taking very high doses of steroids, and the higher the dose, the greater the effect is. Increased aggression, increased confidence, assertiveness. And uh, there's some studies to show an uh, increased risk of uh, mania, a syndrome of abnormally elevated mood. Unknown to the worlds, Kathleen is losing control. Give me the remote. The paper show's on. When someone is in the grip of a manic episode, they don't censor themselves. Susan, unfortunately, had no idea what she was dealing with. How truly dangerous Kathleen had become. Kathleen was a ticking time bomb. In Sydney, Australia, in 2008. 20-year-old Kathleen Worrell is aggravated. Kathleen's moods were becoming unmanageable and her aggression was rising. She needs medication to control her hormone levels, but she's not taking it. Kathleen's aggression levels were so high, one psychiatrist described it as being an athlete on anabolic steroids. With her mind raging, Kathleen is preparing. This is a dangerous state of mind for a man or a woman to be in. She wants to know the quickest way to kill her 18-year-old sister, Susan. There had been a lot of quarrels between the sisters. You're not allowed to touch my things. Fights were sort of symptomatic of what was happening to Kathleen at that time. Kathleen is fighting for control of her mind. She is manic. Her manic state must have emerged over several months with the manipulation of medication and the very high uh, or large fluctuations in her testosterone level. Aware of losing control, she reaches out for help. She sends a message to a friend. It was along the lines of, I intend to murder my sister if I can't be persuaded otherwise. Desperate times, desperate measures. It was a cry for help, but I don't think it was responded to as you might if you actually believed that she was going to do it. Her friend emailed back to her to not do that. And so Kathleen didn't. But come morning, Kathleen has second thoughts. With the sisters alone in the house, Kathleen finds the perfect opportunity. It appears to me that intellectually, Kathleen did not want to kill her sister, but emotionally, she felt overpowered to do so. 
decided not to do it. She closed the door and backed out yet again. Kathleen's self-control is on a knife's edge. It doesn't take much to slip. Incorrect password. Zeus had changed the password for the computer so Kathleen couldn't use the internet. Being mean to Kathleen in Kathleen's state of mind, it was like poking a stick at an angry bull. Kathleen finally snaps. Whatever was in her path, if she was angry, it would have been attacked. With abnormally high levels of testosterone, Kathleen easily overpowers her petite sister. She has all of this muscular development, all of this strength that normally women don't have, so she could do a lot of damage. Susan dies within 30 seconds of being attacked. She is stabbed 50 times. Immediately after the murder, Kathleen calls emergency services. Please. I killed my sister. Pretty clear that her reasoning was quite affected. I mean, she didn't She's think for one minute about what might happen to her after this occurred. Police! Are you armed? No. She didn't even consider about being taken to prison and she didn't consider that her parents might be upset. Kathleen is charged with murder. She receives a psychiatric assessment. She's interviewed by a total of five mental health experts and I think the consensus view was that her um, ability to judge right from wrong and her ability to control her actions were substantially impaired. The charge is reduced to manslaughter. She is sentenced to six years in prison. After a certain amount of time on medication to control it, she was able to calm down. The most shocking part about this was that it was a sister killing her own sister. hadn't necessarily been unloving sisters. In fact, it had been quite the opposite. What's left of the distraught Worrell family has one more tragedy to face. Two months after her conviction, Kathleen is found dead of natural causes in her cell. She was 22. Ultimately, Susan's parents are now without any children. And they lost both their daughters through something hideously tragic. These deadly women cut their blood ties forever. Greed drove Sarah Mitchell to destroy her own sister. Betty Wilson couldn't find the same happiness as her twin, Peggy. And mental illness let Kathleen Worrell destroy her only sister. These women shared a common bond of sibling love and rivalry. All were destroyed by the sins of the sister. Thank you for watching Investigation Discovery. a woman's first love. She was under the mistaken impression that her father was wealthy and, and hiding money from her. You're in weapons. Friends and family can be victims. I'm supposed to die through my head. Very ugly, very brutal. Blood everywhere. Of their greed. I want to get back in.
that one of their own should be the killer. Something which psychologically traumatised that community. And remorse is non-existent. She didn't seem to shed any tears. For these deadly women, life is worth nothing. They kill for cash. A woman wanting revenge. She was very bitter against her father. Can be dangerous. If somebody else had to die, that didn't bother her. And the consequences, unimaginable. No one questioned how ridiculous this plan was. In every town, there are people living on the edge. In 2003, Erie, Pennsylvania, Marjorie Deal Armstrong is one of them. Unable to hold down a job, she's desperate for cash. I had nothing. Nothing. Well, if you've got nothing, what are you complaining about? At 51, Marjorie appeals to her father to bail her out yet again. It's a far cry from her early days. She was a valley Victorian of her high school class, was considered to be an intelligent person. Classmates described her as extremely intelligent, that she had an almost encyclopedic grasp of history, literature, and the law. You don't care a damn about me, Dad. But in middle age, Marjorie has nothing. So when her mother dies and leaves an inheritance of half a million dollars, Marjorie thinks it should be hers. Her father gave her $50,000 and essentially told her he was planning on spending the rest. This did not make her happy. Marjorie believes her father is stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from her. The bipolar disorder that she suffered from seemingly caused lots of problems in, in how she behaved and, and dealt with things. And, and again, it's one of the sad side effects of mental illness. Bipolar disorder is a very serious psychiatric condition characterized by wide mood swings from being extremely depressed to what is known as a mania, a kind of wonderful euphoric high. Marjorie wants revenge against her father and her hands on her inheritance at any cost. Her plan was to hire a hitman to assassinate her father and then she would be rich. So, will you do it, Ken? Yeah, I'll do it. She asks fishing buddy Ken Barnes to do her dirty work. I'm gonna need 125 grand up front. But murder comes at a price. Hey. I can't pay until I get the inheritance. No way. It's money up front, it's no deal. How can an impoverished woman come up with that much cash? By coming up with another madcap scheme. She simply was not using common sense. Decided, oh, well, okay, we'll get $125,000. We'll just rob a bank. Marjorie recruits another accomplice her former lover and science teacher, Bill Rothstein. The box fits on the collar. The collar goes on the neck, obviously. He was really intelligent in terms of how to build complicated and complex devices. That was something he, that he did for students in class. If we use a collar bomb, then they'll have to let him leave the bag. Their heist calls for a human bomb. They wouldn't dare shoot him or try and touch him. And Marjorie knows just the right patsy to wear it. Please, uh. All right. Yeah. You're gonna help us rob a bank. Hey. What? But first, I need to measure your neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm joking, right? 
Brian Wells basically lived by himself. He had cats in a small, very unassuming house, and he'd worked as this pizza delivery man. Brian is told the bomb will be a fake, but trusting Marjorie is dangerous. Marjorie's bipolar mania was absolutely out of control. It was controlling her life. <laughs> no one was safe. Deal Armstrong is holding a deluded grudge against her father. She's prepared to go to extremes to get revenge. This motley crew of characters decided to hatch this plot to rob a local bank and get that money and then use it to pay for the, for the hit on Marjorie Deal's uh, father. It's a great plan. We'll all be rich, James. First, we get the bank. Marjorie shares her secret with her boyfriend, James money. Roden. You must be crazy. Please tell me you're joking. You can't go through with this. But she gets do a it. negative response. Don't do it, or I'll... You're what, James? Don't tell anyone, will you? And that's bad news for James. Of course not. Will you? Marjorie was the type of woman people didn't say no to. She convinces Bill Rothstein, her collaborator, to help cover up the murder. Rothstein not only disposed the body in his freezer, but I understand he also had cleaned up the, the room where the, where the murder had taken place. Marjorie gives him another gruesome task. I promise you grind him up later, though, won't you? Sure. With a lot of these people involved with this conspiracy, we're easily manipulated to do things that possibly they wouldn't actually want to do. And that, that was one of the things with Brian Wells. Marjorie's crazy plan calls for a bank robbery to raise the money to pay for the hitman to kill her father. Thanks, please. The PNC bank will be held up by a man, not with a gun but wearing a fake collar bomb. But on the day of the robbery, Brian Wells finds out the bomb is real. These explosives are real. They are. It's just to make sure you and everyone in the bank behaves. Frank, hey, 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 keep still, Brian. Much movement and that bomb go off. Marjorie's manipulation knows no limits. Everyone in her gang is under her control. Brian's life is in her hands. We believe he was part of the conspiracy up until the time he realized that they're going to put a live bomb on on him. Next, the plan is simple. Brian hands over a note threatening to blow up everyone unless they empty the way that I can get to the boat right now, sir. But from the start, things don't go according to plan. The teller can't open the vault, and Brian only gets money from the till. This is what I can get, sir. which is all she had. Brian Wells said, okay, and walked out of the bank. Brian's day is about to go from bad to worse. As this bank was being robbed by Brian Wells, law enforcement was across the street eating. Be careful. You go off. We heard on the scanner this report of uh, state police had stopped somebody who had just robbed a bank and he had a bomb. And that's when we kind of realize, ah, I don't think this is a this is a fake bomb. Something, something big is going on. This is something that that's beyond the ordinary. Police soon realize the bomb is a threat to everyone. They isolate Brian and call the bomb squad. Why is it nobody trying to get this thing off me? I don't have a lot of time. The state police. There's really not much they could have done. They weren't bomb technicians, they didn't have bomb suits, they don't know what device this is, how it's going to go off, whether it's triggered by a remote. 
So really, there's not a lot they can do. Just sit and wait for the bomb squad to arrive. Witnessing the whole debacle are Marjorie and her accomplice, Bill. They have no control, and neither does anyone else. The bomb squad will be too late. Do you hear me? When all of a sudden, bang. I'm not lying! You could hear the tinkling of shrapnel hitting the ground a few feet from where we were standing. The FBI said that they've never seen anything like before or since. Brian Wells decided to help with the bank robbery. He knew exactly what he was getting into. He did not, however, intend to die. Brian Wells and her boyfriend, James, are dead. And still, Marjorie hasn't got enough money to hire her hitman. Marjorie didn't mind having collateral damage that if in her plot to get money to kill her father, that if somebody else had to die, that didn't bother her. Nobody suspects Marjorie of any crime until Bill Roth. I can't. I can't do it. He has promised to grind up Marjorie's boyfriend, but he would rather give himself up. Police, I need to talk to somebody. I need to report him. January 2005. Marjorie is initially convicted of her boyfriend's murder. It takes another five years to prove her involvement in the collar bomb bank robbery. She is sentenced to life. Had Marjorie sought out psychiatric treatment, it's entirely possible she never would have killed anyone and might have actually had a happy life. Bill Rothstein dies from cancer before he is sentenced. Ken Barnes pleads guilty and is sentenced to 45 years. It's amazing what people will do to, to get what they want. To this day, Marjorie claims her bipolar condition makes her not responsible. The vast majority of people with bipolar disorder, whether treated or not, never, ever would kill another person and never do kill anyone. That isn't what happened here. somebody else she doesn't care about a child and it is difficult to survive she needed those drugs and there was nothing that was going to stop her desperation can lead to desperate action this is not someone we want out walking among us in 1988 on the dark streets of anaheim california a teenage girl is desperate for cash to feed a habit. Rosie used heroin. She used whatever she could get her hands on. Rosie Alfaro's traumatic life has left her scarred. She began using drugs at an early age. She was turned out as a prostitute at the age of 14, constantly running away from home. Rosie's family feels powerless to help. Her mother indicated that she would, would see her um, loaded, see her with the drug use. Rosie has a son, but nowhere to live. The family of a school friend, 18-year-old April Wallace, takes them in. She has a nine-year-old sister, Autumn, who loves having an extended family but the rest of the household doesn't. She was using drugs. No, I thought I and the people that she hung around were drug users. Rosie, can you catch Maddie? No, I don't have time. Can you do it? That's just not good enough. I said that you can stay with us if you hold her out of this night. And where are you going? You should get home resting. No, 
I just gotta meet some friends. Despite the generosity of the family, Rosie doesn't settle down. She passed her time during the day uh, trying to find things that would bring her money so she could buy drugs. She can't stay here if she goes on like that. She's told to leave, but it won't be the last time Rosie visits the Wallaces. Rosie has a new home, a squalid one, and she's desperate for money. She's living near Disneyland, and it was in a kind of a rundown area with a bunch of junkies. Drugs and alcohol in the human body reduce inhibitions. And sometimes when people are high on either one of those things or both, they will do things that they never would have even considered in their clean and sober moments. Want spaghetti? No, uh, you said no more credit. I can't. I'm coming down now. No money, no way. One day on June 15th, 1990, cold-hearted Rosie will do anything to get high. Wait. I know we can get some stuff to sell. In the past, she sold her body. Today, she has another idea. The Wallace family has a routine. Autumn often stayed by herself in the afternoon after school before her mom got home in the evening. So it's a nice surprise for the nine-year-old when she gets a visit from a familiar face. When she saw Rosie at the door, there's no question she would have let her in and just trusted her. Little does she know she's playing with danger. She needed those drugs and there was nothing that was going to stop her. I'm just going to the bathroom, okay? Okay. Teenage mom, Rosie Alfaro, is a drug addict desperate for money. In the past, she has sold herself. Now she has another plan. On June 15th, 1990, nine-year-old Autumn Wallace is home alone. Autumn was a little nine-year-old, a little uh, blonde girl, very cute and uh, very uh, popular at school. And she, was, she gave her, her mom no trouble whatsoever, a very easy child, very smart child. I'll be back soon. Rosie arrives with her baby and two oh, druggies. Listen, uh, give me a break. Hi, but Rosie's idea of robbery is stealing a life. To keep a witness from saying who it was that stole all the stuff out of the house. She realized she's going to have to kill her because she recognized her. Rosie indicated she saw a knife in the kitchen, and she took that knife. I'm just going to the bathroom, okay? Okay. And then went back in the bathroom under the guise of fixing her hair. Can you come in here for a moment? No. And lured Autumn into the bathroom. The stab wounds were in her back and in her front and in her face. They were all over. She was laying on her back. It was very ugly, very brutal. Blood everywhere. She stabbed her repeatedly over 50 times the fact that rosie stabbed autumn in excess of 50 times a nine-year-old girl one well-placed stab wound would have done the job but she does it 50 times or more to me speaks of rage and drugs 
maybe because of that, Rosie didn't want any other little sh** in this killing than we think. Rosie definitely remembers seeing Autumn's eyes looking at her when she, when she finally died. It's very disturbing, very disturbing. Hey guys, open the truck. Rosie ransacks the house. After Rosie stabbed Autumn, she stepped over her and with a bloody footprint, she went from room to room looking for items of steel. Leaving that little boy, that toddler, in the front of that house while she's in there brutally killing a, an eight year old girl. It's just unimaginable for a mother to be able to do that. Two hours later, a hard-working mom's life turns upside down. fencing the stolen goods for a pitiful amount. I'll give you 240, take it or leave it. Afterwards, I think the net figure she got was $240. Um, kind of a cheap price for the life of a little nine-year-old girl. Cash in hand. Rosie returns to the scene of her crime. I'm a friend of April. Can I speak to her? No, ma'am, that's not possible. Often killers return to the scene of the crime. There's a variety of different reasons they do this. Sometimes it's to view the body. Sometimes it's to remove evidence they may have left. Sometimes it's for kicks. It turns them on. Rosie returning to the scene of the crime put her right into the center of the investigation. And she's made another mistake. She leaves a bloody footprint. There's only one footprint in blood near the body. So it, there was a lack of any other footprints. The police officer remembers the suspicious teenager on the night of the murder. They track Rosie down. And that bloody shoe print, they had something concrete to go on. They found the shoes in where she was living and matched a shoe print, too. So in 1992, Rosie Alfaro is convicted of first degree murder and is condemned to die. She had no feelings for what she had done to another human being, especially a young child and especially being a mother herself. It's very disturbing, very disturbing. Rosie chooses drugs over a child's life and has never said sorry. Rosie is a sociopath and she has no empathy for other human beings. And it would help explain why she was able to, number one, murder her friend's little sister in such a horrible way. And number two, have no remorse about it. She remains on death row in the Central California Women's Facility. This is not someone we want out walking among us. www.investigationdiscovery.com Envy of others can be dangerous. That would be her dream, to own such a property. It can turn neighbor against neighbor. She would say anything to get what she wanted. I don't even know if I can tell you. With chilling consequences. This involved a degree of violence that was very great. That leave communities in shock that one of their own should be the killer and psychologically traumatize them. Two thousand six, Nowra, New South Wales, Australia. A small peaceful town where Greg Hosa and his wife, Catherine McKay, own a horse farm. 
They were just a loving couple, gave their time for community um, groups and organisations. They board horses on their property. One of their clients is 35-year-old Kim Snipson, a mom with two young daughters. Kim Snipson seemed to be your average mum. She was an animal lover. She um, had dogs. She had a horse. She um, seemed to like the rural lifestyle of now. But Kim is a very jealous person. She envies Greg and Catherine's small property. She can only dream of owning one for now. Champagne Shires would be her dream to own such a property. It reflected all the things that she loved the most touching upon her connection with animals. Kim has a dark side she hides from her family and an evil plan. A violence to obtain something, probably property. We could do this. We'll kidnap them, get them to sign the house up to me and then kill them. She they tries to recruit acquaintances to help. What do you think? Most think she is joking. Uh, yeah, sure, Kim. No worries. She's not. No, I'm serious. We could do this. We can split the money 50-50. There was a history of manipulative behaviour, lying in order to achieve her ends. There was the element of seeking people to sign over property to her. Friends try to warn Kim's devoted husband, Paul. Then she said, if I could help her to kill them. About her bizarre plots. Kim is afraid. Oh, you're mad. Oh, I would never say that. But he doesn't believe their stories. Oh, she did say that. Oh, no. Kim is a very bright person. She did. Unfortunately, she used that intellect of hers for evil. Kim has the perfect place to staple her horse in the caring hands of Greg and Catherine. She went to the property regularly to to her own horse and got to know Greg and Catherine in that way. They were very well respected and loved in that town. It's a small town, everybody knows each other. Kim always wants something for nothing and doesn't pay the bill. She owed them $300 for taking care of her horses. It's a small amount. Listen, I just wanted to let you know, I can't afford to pay my bill right now. I promise I will pay as soon as I can. Thank you. Thanks. Now, Greg and Catherine are understanding, but that doesn't make Kim happy. Instead, it fuels her jealousy of the couple. She envied what they had. Clearly, she had her sights on them. Kim starts fantasizing about owning their horse property. She wanted them to somehow sign over their, their farm to her. It's an insane idea. But like she's done in the past, she tries to recruit help. I know that you're a family man, and I wasn't even sure if I should be telling you this, but... By doing what she does best, manipulating people. There was a history of manipulative behaviour, uh, lying uh, in order to achieve her ends. She spins neighbour Andrew Flintjar a wicked lie about Greg and Catherine. Andrew was told by Kim that the couple sexually abused her child and had videoed the episode. That's disgusting. People like that should be shot. Exactly. I should belt him for touching her. Perfect. There was no evidence at any time in court that Catherine or Greg had engaged in anything like that. Andrew thinks it's just muscle she wants. Go for it. With Andrew on board, approaches another neighbour. Stacey Lee Caton was a known criminal. He had said that he had wanted to get his life back on track. What? What happened, Kim? Kim fabricates a different story. <laughs> he drugged me. And then he fucked me before me with no sex and It was horrible. Stacey Lee Caton was told by her that a couple had drugged her, uh, sexually assaulted her, and videoed uh, the episode. It seems to be a total fantasy on her part. So she employed a means of modulating the story, depending on the person 
who was the recipient of it, to press the right buttons. The theme was always one of sexual impropriety. And of course, nothing excites people's sympathy more than that. Two men, Stacey. two different lies, but both take the bait. I want to get back in. She knew exactly what to say to each one to get them worked up enough to help her kill. It was a very dangerous thing for her to do, because these two had never met each other before and had no reason to meet. I will pick you. Just tell me what you want me to do. Both men underestimate Kim's true nature. Is it there? Kim Snipson was the perfect sociopath. Sociopaths love to manipulate other people. It's fun for them. They consider it part of the chase, part of the leading up to any crime. Kim's ready to make her twisted dreams a deadly reality. Finally, she worked up to the ultimate crime. I've got an idea. January 28, 2006, Nowra, Australia. 35-year-old Kim Snipson wants something for nothing. Her web of lies has convinced locals Andrew Flintjar and Stacy Lee Caton to help her. They think they are needed to rough up the owners of a horse farm. Hi, Greg, can you come over? There's something on my... quickly after that conversation occurred. He didn't think that he was in any danger or that there would be any problem. Kim, hello, it's me, it's Greg. He was struck to the head with a lump of wood, hogtied, meaning his feet were bound and pulled up behind his back. He said, why is this happening? Andrew Flanchard has said it's because of what you did to the kids or he, he said something about being a pedophile. The men finally realise they have been told different lies. Which is not what Stacey Lee Caton had heard at all. That, according to him, that's not why he was there. Kim must have known that the point in time would be breached where her lies would be exposed. But she would have then taken things to the point of no return. With Greg in agony... Kim calls his wife, Catherine. It's Kim. It's a call any wife you. would dread. There's something I need to tell you about Greg and I. We've been having an affair. Yeah, now's good. See you in a minute. There had never been any affair between Greg and Kim Snipson. Kim! What are you coming on about? Put that phone call there. Greg would never do such a thing to me. What did you do? Ah! 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 She too was hogtied. She too had a sock stuffed in the mouth and tape wrapped around her mouth as well. One can imagine the fear suffered by these people. This involved a degree of violence that was very great. Kim gives Andrew and Stacy Lee chilling instructions. It's more than they bargained for. collected 44 gallon drums from Champagne Shires and brought them back to the house. In an ominous move, Catherine is shoved into the oil drum. Kim has a horrific way to deal with her neighbor's resistance. She murdered Catherine by wrapping the tape around her face and eyes and nose and they stood there and watched her die over several minutes. Stacy Lee Caton looks on. It was never meant to come to this. by garroting him with electrical wire. Kim killed them both deliberately and methodically. Kim is a natural-born killer. She wanted to commit 
murdered, kidnapped and brutally forced into makeshift coffins. A loving husband and wife are dead. Once it got dark, the barrels were loaded into the back of Kim Snipson's station wagon and taken out to the state forest. Kim Snipson commits one final grisly act. They were doused in petrol and set alight. Incinerating the bodies was done for no other purpose than to destroy evidence that those two poor people had ever been to Kim's house that day. I have been involved in some shocking crimes involving dreadful brutality. This case stands out because in my career, I can only reasonably expect to come across one or two sociopaths, and that's what Kim Snipson is. Within hours, unable to live with the horror he's been part of, Stacy Lee Caton reveals the murderous deed. Stacy Lee Caton went next door to his sister's house and spoke to her and her husband and gave them some details of what happened, and they took him to the police station. The community was devastated by it. Devastated. That one of their own should be the killer was something which psychologically traumatised that community. As daylight breaks, police find the gruesome remains. All that remained of Catherine was her right foot and little remained of Greg. Thanks to Stacy Lee's confession, Kim's quickly arrested. Her delusion of taking over the horse farm would never be realized. Would Kim have regret? None. There will be no remorse from Kim Snipson. It's not in her nature. I sat there in that courtroom for a couple of weeks and just, she didn't seem to be shedding any tears. Andrew Flintjar was found guilty of kidnapping and sentenced teen and a half years for aiding and abetting murder. September 5th, 2008, Kim Snipson is found guilty of murdering Greg Hosa and Catherine McKay. She is sentenced to 32 years. I think Kim's the only person that really knows why she did what she did. A small town in Australia will never be the same. It made people wonder, well, it could happen to anybody. And I think it really shook people up. A person who does this lacks the quality that makes up human beings. It's unlikely Kim feels remorse for what she did. Sociopaths never do. If she ever does emerge from prison, watch out. deadly women. Money truly was the root of their evil. Marjorie Deal Armstrong's bizarre plan to get rich left a gruesome trail of death. Drug addict Rosie Alfaro brutally stabbed to death an innocent nine-year-old girl for a few hundred dollars. And Kim Snipson viciously murdered a loving couple to steal their property. These deadly women were ready and able to kill for cash. Thank you for watching Investigation Home is where the heart is. A safe haven. Robin had taken out five insurance policies, which totaled over a quarter of a million dollars. It can also be filled with deception. She was having and killing a child once a year. And with danger. Pulling the trigger was actually just perfunctory to the goal. These deadly women murder those who love them the most. They 
sacrifice their blood. people could escape were blocked by fire. My babies are in there. The mother is frantic. Her two children and husband are trapped inside. I think most of us would think is the most horrific way that you could pass away. It will take a miracle to get them out alive. single mother, Robin Lee, lands on her feet when the local YWCA gives her a job. She was running a uh, bingo game for a local uh, nonprofit organization. Robin arrived in town with two children and about two bucks her name. The charity work is a gamble, but it seems to have paid off. They had embraced her and thought she was a good person. She could be the very strong business manager, the leader. She did philanthropic things for the community and for the homeless. I said get to bed this instant. But there's another side to Robin. She's not as kind and caring to her own. You're going to bed now. I hate you. She could be different people at different times. You get a divorce, I'm going to be Good. You deserve each other. She basically would be the person you wanted her to be. When she remarries local man, Randy Rowe, there's no domestic bliss. Randy was a, a good, simple human being. Just a... Randy doesn't make enough money to satisfy Robin. We can't pay my medical bills. How are we supposed to pay for this? They argue constantly over her exorbitant spending. She was very materialistic, had lots of nice things for the money she had. Uh, in fact, the apartment had uh, quite a few nice furnishings for uh, her level of socioeconomic income. When the family's finances hit rock bottom, Robin decides it's time for a change. Robin was motivated by money. I know you're unemployed, Randy. That's the problem, isn't it? Robin was motivated by her freedom. I believe she wanted to start a new life. Oh, my God. What happened to you? But Robin isn't interested in walking away empty-handed. She spreads a story that Randy is abusive. She claimed that she needed to get away from Randy. You just call me if you need anything, okay? Robin had lied about these domestic violence problems where her husband Randy was attacking her and threatening her. Are you sure you don't mind? I know I've been sitting over a lot. It's bad. You can't be there. Randy acted the way he is. A close friend, Joan, believes her and offers her shelter. You just have a good night's rest. Good day off the clock. Joan, with the biggest heart in the world, bought into it and was helping her friend and protecting her. What Joan didn't know is that Robin was manipulating and using her as cover. In the early morning of February 10th, 1992, Robin startles Joan out of her sleep. Joan, Joan, get up, get up. What is it? I've got to go home. Something terrible is happening. What do you mean? What's wrong? I, I know something has happened. I know something is terribly wrong. Please come with me. She said, I've had this premonition that something is terribly wrong. <laughs> This is no bad dream. Robin's fears are real. They arrive to find Robin's house in flames and the firefighters in despair. Inside the home are the bodies of her son, daughter, and husband. No one could save them. 
Detective Gary Rainey leads the investigation into the blaze that starts to look like arson. It appeared somebody may have poured an exert, was turned off from the garage. And the furnace thermostat was set in the full-on position and it actually excelled the fire and drew it up into the second floor much more rapidly. A tragic fire becomes a murder investigation. But who would want Robin's family dead? The first thing that started coming to my mind as I spoke with Robin uh, just a few hours after the fire uh, was her lack of emotion. And this just, in my mind, was not normal for a mother. December 1992. The community of Boise, Idaho is mourning the deaths of the Roe family in a house fire. Fate saves the mother, Robin. She's sleeping at a friend's that night. But she seems to know more about the fire than she ought to. Why didn't the smoke alarm go off? The EMG was very suspicious of Robin's behavior because no one had told Robin that the fire alarms didn't go off. Robin's own words are incriminating her. Robin tries to use the fire to cover up another crime. She tells police the proceeds from the bingo nights have been destroyed. She reported that the money from the bingo proceeds had been lost in the fire. We found the bingo box with all of the proceeds in, to, in it. Police dig deeper and discover Robin has been stealing the bingo money for months. She had been embezzling from the bingo operation that she was running. Robin now finds herself in custody over the theft. She was arrested for grand theft for that case, but that also got her contained in a county jail uh, while I could continue to investigate. With Robin locked away, and just one more. The investigation uncovers another of her schemes. Robin had taken out five insurance policies on her two children and Randy, and which totaled over a quarter of a million dollars. All right, we're all done. I'm just wondering, Bill, since this is a new policy, how long before it takes a bit? Well, with this policy, you get coverage straight away. Oh, great. The last life insurance policy she took out just 16 days prior to the fire. Well, unless there's anything else, I think we're all done here. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you, Ralph. The more and more convinced I became that she was responsible. Robin's past discloses an even bigger shock. This isn't the first time Robin Lee Rowe has had bad luck with fires. She has lost another child in a house fire. Let me guess. Kate was well insured. You betcha. Twelve years earlier, her six-year-old son, Keith, died the same way. She was living in a borrowed cabin. Uh, she had no job. She had no car. But she took out $28,000 worth of life insurance on her son, Keith. Keith was asleep in the bedroom uh, when a fire started in the cabin. The chances of a mother losing one child in a house fire are astronomical. The chances of that same woman losing a second family in a house fire when she wasn't there are unbelievable. It's too much of a coincidence, but police still can't move because Robin has a watertight alibi. She is asleep at her friend Jones. She was sleeping downstairs on the couch. She couldn't have set this fire. There may be a way to trip Robin up. While she's in custody for grand theft, police convince Joan to take part in a sting. She tells a lie to try and get Robin to tell the truth. Get out of the fire. Something broke me. I went downstairs and you were there. I couldn't sleep either. I was upset about Randy and me finding him, so I went out to the car and called my psychiatrist. The psychiatrist could give you an alibi? No, I don't want her involved. Robin admitted that she
that she was not in the apartment at 3.30 in the morning, and that was the epiphany to Joan to realize her very, very dear friend had committed murder. Goodbye, Joan. No one believes Robin was on the phone. About 3 o'clock in the morning, she left, uh, drove to her house. While Randy, 10-year-old Joshua, and 8-year-old Tabitha sleep soundly, Robin disables the smoke alarms and turns up the heat. She poured an accelerant beginning below the stairwell at the top, the landing on the second floor. Then she poured a trailer of accelerant down along the side of the stairwell on the lower level. The stage is set for the perfect fire. She stood at the front door and in one fatal moment dropped a match lit the smoke immediately fills the house then the lungs of randy joshua and little tabitha these individuals begin to start coughing violently tissues body-wide are beginning to starve from oxygen it leads to confusion and then to drowsiness they tend to succumb and their heart will stop beating the manner in which she killed her children and her husband horrible they died a horrible death. Randy was found laying in his bed in the master bedroom. Joshua was found on top of his bed, down in the bedroom. Tabitha was sleeping across the end of her parents' bed, where she often would if she was a little scared at night. And that's where her body was found. The three of them, Randy, Josh, Joshua, and Tabitha, uh, simply became no longer worth it to Robin. By 1992, police have enough evidence to charge Robin Lee Rowe with three counts of first-degree murder. She's found guilty and sentenced to death and awaits execution in an Idaho prison. Robin Rowe is definitely where she needs to be and should never be let out of prison. The only thing people really meant to Robin was a nice payday. It's a parent's worst nightmare, losing a newborn baby. Would you like to hold me? But for this family, it is the start of a tragedy no one can imagine. Schenectady, New York State. Joe and Mary Beth Tinning can take comfort in their two surviving children, Barbara and Joseph. Joe was very happy. Joe really wanted children, and he loved them. What is going on back there? But friends notice that Mary Beth doesn't take to motherhood as others do. She appeared to love them. You are so in trouble. She didn't like to deal with the messy part of bringing up a baby, the diaper changing, burping part, the screaming all night part. I think she liked them only as playthings, as toys. But Mary Beth's toys are their two-year-old son, Joseph, dies, and there's no explanation. It's terribly, terribly hard. Everybody flocked around. All the friends and family would run in and lavish her with attention and sympathy. Joseph was just a <laughs> Despite her tragic loss, Mary Beth seems to joy being fussed over all of a sudden she got attention from everybody and it made her have a purpose in life you know and that's why i think she really uh she just fed off of that she fed off the kids the family is still in mourning when their only surviving child barbara contracts a mystery illness the doctor insists barbara's overnight in the hospital usually when these children are brought to the hospital and are getting good medical care they improve no no i'm taking a home should be much happier 
But Mary Beth has other ideas. No, I want to close with me. Barbara is home less than an hour. So I please help me. Before she's rushed back in critical condition. Before morning, she is dead. The nurses at both hospitals gossiped a lot about their suspicions about her. But nobody was prepared to actually face her because they couldn't have proof. Joe was very distressed when Barbara, the elder child, died. But these children kind of came and went like little wraiths, you know. The Tinning's three children have died within three months. It's a medical mystery. If you've got three kids that die, you really got to be aware that something else is wrong. Joe Tinning was the perfect foil for Mary Beth. Because he was so accepting of everything she said and did, you wondered how he could have his children die one after another, one after another, and never, never say, well, is there something you're doing wrong? One of his quotes I remember was, well, you have to believe the wife. When people look at a woman, especially a mother, they do not ever see a killer. There must be another explanation as to why these children are dying. Have passed the danger age. Kids that are up and walking around do not die from sudden infant death syndrome. Instead, they suspect a bad family seed. She and Joe were sent to one of the leading children's hospitals in the country to check whether there wasn't some genetic factor. Doctors don't find a cause for the deaths, but the Tinnings are advised not to have any more children. But that doesn't stop Mary Beth. What are you doing? Oh, please don't hate me, Joe. I'm pregnant again. A year after bearing her third child, she's pregnant again. Please, I can do this. We can. And the cycle of life and death will continue. advice, she gets pregnant again. In November 1973, she gives birth to a healthy baby boy, Timothy. He is two weeks old when he too is rushed to the emergency room. They all follow the same path. Mary Beth would rush to the hospital carrying a dying or dead child and say, I found him like this in his crib. Please try and save him. She appeared terribly concerned. Is everything okay? My baby's not breathing. Over the next decade, Mary Beth gives birth to four more children and they all die inexplicably. She would go from hospital to hospital. She wouldn't go to the same one over again to let somebody put the blame on her. She was smart that way. But none of the medical professionals see what the real problem is. They don't realize Mary Beth is suffering from Munchausen by proxy. Someone suffering from Munchausen hurts themselves to draw attention to themselves, sympathy from others. Munchausen by proxy is wherein someone hurts someone else, makes them sick or injures them or in them. Mary Beth Kate followed that pattern pretty closely. But Joe is ignorant and still wants a family. The couple decide to adopt a child 
Michael. But Joe's happiness doesn't last long. Mary Beth now turns her lethal intentions on him. She tries to poison Joe with an overdose of prescription drugs. Whether she wants to kill him or just make him sick is unclear. She finally, when he was taken ill, confessed to her brother-in-law, who rushed Joe to the hospital and got him pumped out, saved his life. Police investigator Bill Barnes remembers questioning Joe about the poisoning. Why did you take so many pills, Joe? He didn't show the emotion. He might have felt it inside, but he didn't show it. You know, you could have died. And therefore, uh, when I asked him, I said, you know, she tried to poison you, and he acknowledged that he thought she did. But if she did, she did, you know. It doesn't seem to bother him too much. For some reason, Joe doesn't resent his wife's murder attempt or his children's deaths. Not even when their adopted son, Michael, home alone with Mary Beth, becomes the next victim. Once again, Mary Beth seeks medical help too late. She called the doctors and the nurse made an appointment for her to bring the baby in at 10. She shows up at 10 o'clock with the baby that had been dead for two hours. When she had an adopted child and that child died, all of a sudden there was no longer the possibility of this being an inherited or congenital disorder. All of a sudden it was something in the home and in all likelihood it was the mom. The Tinning children did not have a genetic disorder. They had a killer mom disorder. Finally, after 13 years, friends and nursing staff pressure authorities to investigate the deaths of all the Tinning's children. old when Mary Beth has had enough of her. The child woke up and cried. She couldn't stop the crying, so she smothered her. Very, very hard to prove that a very small infant that who has been smothered hasn't simply died of crib death. By now, there's no doubt these deaths were not from natural causes. The police finally bring Mary Beth in for questioning. It is Bill Barnes who gets her to talk. First she denied it, you know, with me. And then uh, when I brought Joe into it and said that, you know, he said he was Sam Byer, uh, she then, she blurted it out, she said, I did it. I killed, uh, she killed Tammy Lynn, she killed three of her children, Nathan, Timothy, and Tammy Lynn. Most people believe she killed them all. Although police suspect she killed her entire family, they only need one murder charge to lock Mary Beth Tinning away. In 1987, she is found guilty of second-degree murder of her last child, Tammy Lynn, and is sentenced to 20 years to life. Mary Beth was astounded. I don't think it really had hit her until then that she was going to jail and that she was going to jail for a very long time. Mary Beth craves attention at the cost of her own blood. 23 years in jail has not changed her one whit as far as her psychic state. I have always thought she didn't belong in prison. She belonged in a psychiatric institution. Joe promises his wife he will stand by her. And true to his word, today he still visits Mary Beth in prison. I can't understand how any man would go back to a woman who'd do that. 
But there he is after 23 years, still visiting her in jail, still saying that he'll provide a home for her if and when she comes out. Mary Beth is now eligible for parole, but so far it has been denied. What sticks out mostly in my mind was how anybody could do that, you know, to their children, how anybody could do that to their husband. How could you be driven that far to kill another human being? I, I don't, I don't know. Mary Beth Tinning is... Get more deadly women online. www.investigationdiscovery.com Why do you have to drink so much? A common domestic argument. Parents disagreeing on how to Back discipline the, their yeah. children. I'm taking away your TV and video game privileges. Get to your room. I said, get to your room. It should be easy get to resolve, to room. but not in this family. Why are you always taking this up? I'm not taking sides. I just think you're overreacting. The tension was growing in their household, and, and it, it went over the top. Because she was a woman pushed over the brink. California, 1999. Settle down, please. Cora and Xavier Caro are active members of the Santa Rosa Valley community. They were very close. They went on a lot of family vacations. They went to movies a lot. They, they did a lot of things together, especially going to church. They were a very religious family. Well, if we can certainly have them Saturday, can we? Cora's a busy mom with four young boys under 12. I was going to ask you, would you mind making some of those amazing cookies of yours? It would be my pleasure. Let me know what else I can do, okay? But she is always ready to lend a hand. I'll see you on the weekend. Thank you very much. This was a woman we knew from classroom volunteering and from church activities. We always saw her giving high fives with her children and hugging them. She was... By all accounts, a, a loving mother. The couple live and work together. Oh, hello, Mrs. Baker. It's good to see you again. Oh, it's quite the taskmaster, my husband. He's got me shackled up at the desk here. Oh. I'll take the shackles off. Which he is, is a doctor, and she's his office manager. Bye-bye. She deserted her nursing career and became his office manager. Her husband and sons became her whole life but behind the perfect facade Cora's hiding secrets how can we owe so much money we had a lot of expenses you she's a thief in I just one year she has siphoned oh, off one hundred thousand dollars from the medical we clinic need it, babe. We need it. I'm not letting you anyway. he discovered that his practice was deeply in debt credit card Sense when it turned out that she was funneling money from the office accounts to her parents. Laura has another problem alcohol. She was drinking a lot. She became depressed. Her husband finally talked her into trying some antidepressants. Cora's problems were far deeper than could be treated simply with a pill. Cora probably needed hospitalization. Cora isn't the only one with secrets. Xavier is an adulterer. He had an affair with a biofeedback technician who worked in his office. Cora found out, and it crushed her. And she has something else to fear. She found a worksheet that he and his attorney had recently compiled. And it was a divorce attorney. And it was at that point that she realized this could happen. And this is real. Cora's world had fallen apart. Not only was her husband leaving her, she had been replaced in her mind by another woman. Thinking she is about to lose her marriage, Cora threatens to harm herself. She was confiding to a friend on the phone that she would be better off dead. 
and that she was holding a gun at that moment. Please sit down. She believed her life was over. She was going to lose everything. What is it? A concerned friend goes to see Xavier. She talks about killing herself. She wouldn't do that. She wouldn't. He thought that she was just being overly dramatic. Huh? She's a drama queen. You know that. But he was concerned, apparently, about this incident where she confided to her friend that she'd be better off dead. Xavier tries to convince his wife to seek professional help. Cora could not see up. She was so far down. She believed her life was over. She was going to lose everything. And she was in a black, crushing depression. Cora has her own plans. A modern day tragedy. When people are in that frame of mind, they don't think correctly. In the late 1990s, Santa Rosa Valley, California, Cora, you cannot be serious. Bring Xavier down, and Cora Caro's marriage please, is falling please, apart. Everything I've done for you all these years. She's been stealing from him. He has been having an affair. And now they're living on a razor's edge. It won't take November 22nd, 1999. It was uh, in the evening, and they had just had dinner. What are you doing? They That's were drinking margaritas, drink and one of their sons came downstairs. Dad, don't you think you've had enough? The boy mouthed off a little, and that's when a fight broke out over disciplining this boy. I'm leaving. Where are you going? To the However, the fight they ended up having was much more extreme don't than that. No! He was going to his office to cool down and to do some work. something like one and a half times the legally permissible amount of alcohol in her system. She also had some drugs. She became very robotic and cold. I always admired that thing. You always know the difference between right and wrong. She was machine-like. That gave him a chill, and he ran home. Cora gets her children ready for bed. Every night, Cora would tuck her kids in and she'd put a little Bible underneath their pillows. She has made the decision and she was going through the motions until the time when she could carry out the plan. Jesus, no! Xavier arrives home too God, late Cora, to stop Jesus, Cora's madness. What? There was his wife with a gun by her side, uh, bleeding from the head. She wanted to die. So she shot herself in the head, and he discovered her body. But where are the children? <sighs> Chitino will never forget the night he is called to the Caro's house. We could hear him crying. Oh, God! Jesus! <laughs> it just seemed like the whole world had kind of crashed down around him. quickly put the puzzle together. She went upstairs to where the family's bedrooms were. Eight-year-old Michael and five-year-old Christopher are sound asleep. She 
shot each of them by holding the gun to their heads. It was an act of revenge because she was taking the things away from her husband that he cherished the most. She then went into the room where her oldest boy was alone. He had apparently gotten up as a result of the noise and he was sitting somewhat upright in bed. She shot him once. Then she shot him again. She then turned his body over so that his face would be up to greet her husband. The tragedy just hammers you. I think it was horrendous in the fact that three small children and you see them and they've been basically cut down in the prime of their life. Uh, you know, life had been taken away from them. Pulling the trigger on their little heads was actually just perfunctory to the goal of getting them and herself where she felt they needed to be. And that was gone. She had some very deep pools of insecurity and anger and all kinds of turbulent passions in her life before the killings, but came out most obviously and most explosively when she held the gun to uh, her each of her uh, children's heads. The only child Cora spares is baby Gabrielle. He was in his crib, and maybe she just couldn't bring herself to do that. Incredibly, despite a horrific head wound, Cora lives to face justice. Some people kill their children, and then they make a very half-hearted suicidal gesture. That isn't the case here. She shot herself in the head. Very few people survive that. Cora initially enters a plea of insanity, but against her lawyer's advice, withdraws it. She is convicted of the brutal slaying of her three sons and is sentenced to death. She currently awaits execution in a California prison. I don't think Cora was born to kill. She's on death row for this desperate, horrible act because she was a woman pushed over the brink. Some mothers are maternal and some mothers are monsters. Robin Lee Rowe burns her home and family for money. Mary Beth Tinning gives life and takes life away from eight children. And Cora Caro shoots her three sons to avenge her husband. These deadly women don't provide love and shelter. They martyr their families. They sacrifice their blood. Thank you for watching Investigation Discovery. loved ones she knew that it was only a matter of time before he sexually abused their little daughter for revenge i want you to go now kate i know where to go man where should i go i think a culmination of all the stresses just made her snap no really you couldn't get these yourself or to be free from responsibility she had a goal that he was not going to clutter her life any longer. These deadly women become cold-blooded killers when they reach their breaking point. <laughs> 2008, 
in the charming seaside town of Belfast, Maine. A wealthy young couple seemed to have everything. And they were pretty inseparable. James inherited all this money from his father, millions of dollars. It looked like they would have a charmed life. But James and Amber Cummings are living with secrets. Their 12-year-old marriage is miserable. He didn't appear to have a lot of uh, relationships with people or, or with his family. Kept to himself. Amber is afraid of her husband and has been for years. He abused her physically, emotionally, sexually. He tore down every shred of her individuality. This guy's gonna run the country? And James has some alarming political views. What is this world coming to? He's a white supremacist. How the hell is he supposed to run the country? He's calling. I'm going kill him. And he's using his newfound wealth to pursue a macabre hobby. James became obsessed with Nazi paraphernalia. He spent a lot of his inheritance seeking out items that Hitler had owned. His behavior is fueled by a delusional mental illness. It was James lives in a constant state of paranoia. Where have you been? I had to get out of the house for a while. Oh, you think you can leave the house? Yeah. Where'd you go? I went to your brother's. I don't want you going to my brother's house. He can't tolerate other people in Amber's life. I don't want you going anywhere. You got that? What is wrong with you? I can't stay in here forever. You want to stay here? What is wrong with you? You're acting crazy. He wages a campaign to cut them out. He isolated her from her family. They moved several times so he could keep her isolated. James and Amber have a daughter. But he is no kinder to her. When he tried to beat the daughter, she would step in between them and take the beating herself. Do you understand? Where do you think you're going? Nurse! Daddy! What's going on, Clara? Honey, just go upstairs. What is going on? What are you doing? She's not doing anything wrong. She is just a kid. Even though that made James angrier and made him hit her worse. I'm teaching her discipline. This is something you don't understand. You're disgusting. subjected to marital rape on a regular basis. to escape from James and always failed and he got angry and the abuse escalated there's no way out for Amber Cummings James controls her every move come here come here now his perversions come here sit down sit down. grow even more disturbing now I want you to pick me the best one. Oh my god. What do you think? They're children. That's right. They're great, huh? He had become a 
obsessed with child pornography. He had hundreds of images of child pornography on his computer. Jeez, that's horrible. Oh, come on. Mom, I don't think just spelling book. Honey, I'll be there in a second. Just wait outside for me, okay? Okay. Well, come on. Pick your best one. That one. All right. His authority is unchallenged. His violence unchecked. He ran his house like Hitler ran Germany. Amber reaches her breaking point. In a quiet New England town, a rich young couple is hiding secrets. Nazi sympathizer James Cummings is addicted to child pornography. All right, gorgeous. You are good to go. You want to go downstairs and play? Thanks, thanks for you, Mom. By December 2008, his battered wife, Amber, is about to snap. Amber got up with her daughter. Seemed like a normal morning. And then she walked into the bedroom, pulled the 45 from under the pillow. Domestic violence victims, they very often think about a way out of the situation is to kill themselves. On the brink of ending her life, Amber realizes if she dies, who will protect her daughter from her monster of a father? What troubled her most was his child pornography collection. She knew that it was only a matter of time before he sexually abused their little daughter. Amber Cummings could never stand up to James explodes to the surface. There's only one thing for her to do. She couldn't leave Clara there with him. She walked into James's bedroom. While her sadistic jailer sleeps, she takes his gun and pulls the trigger. Everybody has a breaking point. Ultimately, take away all the socialization that we've been subjected to since the moment we came out to the world. We are animals. And animals can attack. Amber takes her daughter to a neighbor's house and calls police. Clara, we've got to go. Quickly, come on, let's go outside. Chief of police Jeffrey Trafton will never forget the scene. It's hard for us to justify shooting somebody who's asleep in a bed. He looked more like a victim than a shooter. Expressionless, like just like a shell of a person, really. Amber killed to protect her daughter. But as police discover, she may have done something else. Change the course of history. When the FBI came into that house, what did they find? All the ingredients for a dirty bomb, including uranium. Looks like we have a manual. They found some of that stuff was radioactive. In James's twisted racist view of the world, Barack Obama should never be president. They were going to drive to Washington, D.C. for uh, President Barack Obama's inauguration, and he was going to 
Explode a dirty bomb down there. Amber shoots James just one month before the presidential inauguration. James Cummings' evil plan could have killed thousands. Amber killed her husband. She is 100% responsible for his death. But, but possibly the United States. In a civilized society, Amber's vigilante justice can't stand unchallenged. A murder trial must take place. And it touches a nerve. She had probably upwards of 100 people in this community show up for her sentencing day, most of which were wearing t-shirts that read, Free Amber. Pleading guilty, Amber's fate is left to a single judge. Amber was given an eight-year sentence that was fully suspended, so she walked away from the Waldo County Superior Courthouse a free woman. There's still a certain segment that don't agree that she should have shot him and killed him. But I do believe that the community as a whole has, has forgiven her. Free from her abuser and any jail sentence, Amber makes an extraordinary request. She did ask the community to forgive her husband. She had said, look, he had some problems and I don't want the community to hold any anger towards him. Amber Cummings is a deadly woman. She murdered her husband while he was sleeping. But seeing her story, it's easy for me to understand how Amber was created. suburbs of London, England. Home renovators make a grisly discovery. The mini digger unearthed a, uh, a skull. We knew that it was not just a grave site. It was, it was a skull on its own. A lone human skull can only mean foul play. But to whom does it belong? They managed to narrow it down to uh, a death between the 17th century and uh, 1880. To identify this antique victim, police will have to delve into London's dark past and reopen a murder case that scandalized a brutal city. Kate Webster is celebrating moving to London. Kate Webster was an Irish woman um, who came to England and effectively was a career criminal. Kate hasn't come to London for a job. She's come to steal. But she's not very good at it and is soon caught and jailed for five years. On her release, she is determined to have an easier life. Kate Webster's life couldn't have been much harder than it was. Kate had almost no education. She worked in people's homes as a housekeeper, and she wasn't very good at that. Kate finds the perfect employer. Naive widow, Julia Thomas. She had a nice house. She would wear jewellery and rings. She was a church-going lady, very prim and proper. But Mrs. Thomas didn't know about her background. Do you have some references for me? Oh, no. I just come to London. I've come from Ireland. And unfortunately, I don't have any references, but I'm so keen to work. So keen to work for you, Mrs. Thomas. She didn't like work. I mean, she resented doing the work. She wasn't a very good maid. It's a very large house, Kate. Have you worked in such a large house before? I have. I have. I've noted. I did notice there was some dust in the mantle. I can see you need some help. Well, yes. Shall we start straight away? Let's start. Kate 
Kate Webster is a talented con artist and thief, but an atrocious housekeeper. She was a clumsy lady. She would slam the, the table, the trays down on the tables. Mrs. Thomas would complain about Kate. And Kate has a more serious problem. She's an alcoholic. And a bad-tempered drunk. She was a big drinker. She was often annoyed at people. Julia Thomas decides to make a stand. She feared Kate Webster. She had built up the courage to sack her. Mrs. Thomas to give her time to find accommodation. You better watch yourself, Mrs. Go! Then she did allow Kate to spend the weekend in her home before she left. I think this was a big mistake. Sunday, January 13th, 1879. It's Kate's last day of work. Where did Kate go? She went to the pub. Mrs. Thomas was not happy again. She'd done her a favor and let her stay for the weekend. But now Kate's late back from the pub. I want you to go now, Kate. Uh, I know where to go, ma'am. Where shall I go? Mrs. Thomas is waiting for her, and an argument ensued. I don't care. I've given you plenty of chances. I, I gave you notice. No, I want you out of my house right now. She threw her down the stairs. just made her snap. Kate Webster has killed her employer. But she doesn't run. For the first time in her life, now Kate had some power, and she used it. Kate has come up with a monstrous plan that will shock London society. London, 1879. Drunken housekeeper Kate Webster has murdered her employer. Now she chooses the most gruesome method to get rid of the body. Kate effectively spends the rest of Sunday and Sunday evening trying to dispose of the body. It's a horrifying process. She dismembered the body using a meat saw 
an eraser. Maisie's servant, Kate, is now hard at work. She hacks into Mrs. Thomas's neck and saws off her head. Blood was all over the kitchen itself, in corners of the room. So, I think it's fair to say, disgusting. It's a lot easier to get rid of a human body than the way Kate went about it and a lot less ghoulish to simply bury a body in the basement. There was something in Kate that drove her to do that. I think she liked it. With Julia Thomas's body in pieces, Kate cooks up an ungodly stew. She thought she could dissolve the body by boiling it. Neighbor next door said that uh, she could smell a uh, horrible, rancid smell. She makes human lard out of the boiling body fat. The residue that's left in the pot is really some of the fats that have coalesced. You're left with what looks like lard. It is not a far stretch for her to have given this particular mixture to people, cannibals, and said that the taste of human tissue was similar to that of a pig. Kate sells the lard at her local tavern. Some of the locals in the area, they had reported that uh, in the days after the murder, and they proceeded to eat it. Hmm. Delicious. Kate spreads a story that she's had a stroke of good luck. Her aunt, Mrs. Thomas, had passed away. But she'd inherited a house. It's an outrageous lie. But people believe it. She wore Julia's clothes and she tapped into her bank account. She could be somebody she had always wanted to be, but never could. She became a wealthy old woman. Kate still has to dispose of the body. The torso was placed in a wooden box. Kate dumps it in the Thames. But not all the body parts will fit. She squeezes the head into a handbag. Most people would not chop someone up and carry the head around in a bag. Kate seems to have gone nuts. Kate hides the head where it remains undisturbed for over a century. The other body parts are found much sooner. Just five days after the murder. Kate was really a much sicker woman than anyone really knew. It is not long before Kate's story of an inheritance unravels. She's quickly arrested and convicted of murder. Although it's rare at the time for a woman to receive a death sentence, Kate Webster is hanged. You look at what she actually did. How could you not say that's evil? 130 years later, the final piece of the case is solved. The skull was, was recovered from an area that had previously been a stable. Kate Webster would have known that well. She frequented the pub. Julia Thomas can finally be laid to...
If that murder hadn't happened on that day, Kate would have eventually had a row with someone and they would have ended up dead. And then possibly in the kitchen. Get more deadly women online. www.investigationdiscovery.com A dying husband needs a devoted wife. He was generally suffering a miserable existence. But when there's no love left... Wendy was hardly the dutiful caregiver to her sick and dying husband. A marriage becomes a burden. This is not someone that I ever want to be around if she snaps again. Summer 2000, Maricopa, Arizona. Are you doing my toast? An everyday domestic scene. There. Except this family is living in tragic circumstances. I want some jelly. Joe was diagnosed with a very serious cancer, and he was terminal. He was generally suffering a miserable existence. Uh, Wendy, what? Would you mind getting my pills? Joe, really, you couldn't get these yourself. It's on for me to get out of the chair. Sure it is. The dynamics of the family at the time that Joe got sick quickly went sour. Joe Andriano has only months to live. His 30-year-old wife, Wendy, isn't coping. Now I have to go to work. Oh, am, am I being... Joe! I can't do this for everyone, okay? I can't take care of everyone all the time! Wendy is a bad nurse. Have it! Too much, Joe. And she resents the pressure of being caregiver and the only breadwinner. Wendy often doesn't come home after work. She's leading a double life. Miss Adriana was noted for going out to bars and clubs. How? She pretends she's single and available. It was difficult to understand why she would prefer to carouse with other men when her husband was at home, terminally ill. Wendy even flaunts her affairs in front of her husband. It's hard to say if she was always crazy, wild, angry. We don't know. What we do know is how she acted when he was dying. Something was seriously wrong here. Wendy's uncaring attitude is matched by her greed. She set about to commit fraud and actually asked two different men to pretend to be her husband. Listen, Rick, I need to ask a favor. What? I need you to pose as Joe in a medical exam and tell the insurance company that he did not have cancer so he can get a life insurance policy. Why? The fact that she attempted to get this other life insurance was just a, a, an indication of how greedy she really was. I can't do that. Rick, we need your help. Look, I will give you $10,000. I can't do that. She was seeking, at least in that, a $1 million life insurance policy. No, I can't. She can't get insurance, but Wendy no longer cares. She just wants Joe out of the way. Wendy could not wait for her husband to die from 
his cancer. She had a goal that Joel Adriano was not going to clutter her life any longer. If Joe's cancer is slow to kill him, Wendy will give death a helping hand. October 8, 2000, Maricopa, Arizona. Joe Andriano, a cancer sufferer, is in agony. Joe was very ill. He was just writhing in pain. I need an ambulance for my husband. He hears his wife, Wendy, call 911. Yes, he has terminal cancer. But no paramedics arrive because Wendy is just pretending. Thank you. Please be quick. Wendy had a plan for him. She couldn't wait for him to die of natural causes. Uh, where are the paramedics? <laughs> it's all part of Wendy's plan that started hours earlier. She heated some soup on the stove and replaced the medication with sodium azide and had given him that. Here's your soup. Thanks, it's a toxic weed killer, lethal to humans. Is it good? Mm -hmm. And she set about on a plan to murder her husband as quickly as possible. Joe is left in agony for almost an hour. Finally, Wendy thinks he is on death's door and contacts a neighbor. It was really unclear as to why she did that, but uh, the friend did come over. I just have to quickly tell you, please don't ask any questions. I mean, he's on the floor and they're dying, but he doesn't know I haven't called 911. What do you mean you haven't called 911? I, I just think it would be you better. Need call, you need to call 911. Wendy, you need to call 911. You have to call it. You want me to make the call? It was the neighbor's view that perhaps 911 should be called immediately. Joe. Joe is crazy. Under pressure, Wendy finally calls emergency. Me. <laughs> Hello? My name is Wendy Adriano. Now, I made a call earlier for an ambulance, and we're still waiting. Oh, we called up her minutes. Okay. Five minutes ago. Oh, they're going to be here any minute. Yes, Joe kept yes, saying, why is it taking 911 so long to get here? He was under the impression that 911 was on their way. Oh, they need help. But uh, Wendy decides... She can't risk paramedics snooping around. We need to get him into the car. We're going to take him to the hospital. Uh, uh, the ambulance. I don't know, Joe. We've called them. I don't know how long it's going to take. Help. We're going to get you into the car, okay? Miss Andriano uh, grabbed Joe from underneath his arms. Joe, Joe, get up. Then uh, try to get him up so that she could put him in the car. Oh, where is the ambulance? ambulance? Joe, get up. Her plan Joe, to poison Joe go, isn't Joe. working. Joe, get up! Oh. We're going to go! Joe, it's sick of it! Get up! Get up! By now, he should be dead. She miscalculated how much poison. It wasn't fast enough. <laughs> At that point, the neighbor said, look, I hear the siren. Now I'm going to go outside to guide them in. When paramedics arrive, Wendy comes up with a cold-hearted lie. Ma'am, no, come in here. Help. My husband is dying from terminal cancer, okay? His DNR, do not resuscitate. He doesn't want your help, Wait, think about this, open the door, He please. doesn't want to die this way, okay? Uh, His DNR, no, DNR, no. no. She was afraid that he would miraculously be saved. Can't you guys do something? Yes. The paramedics believe her and leave. Sorry. Sorry. Sealing Joe's fate. <laughs> It was very important for her to murder her husband. I need help! Now, no one can stop Wendy. Where are the paramedics? Oh! She immediately started to hit him in the back of the head. I need help! Oh. 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 
struck him so hard that there were holes on the top of his head. She bludgeons him 23 times. It was brutal because of the fact that Joe did not die quickly. Joe, who bravely fought cancer, can't fight his wife. She grabbed one of the kitchen knives that were there. And in the area where the cancer actually started, she stuck that in the side of his neck. I think it's safe to say that Wendy snapped. This is not someone that I ever want to be around if she snaps again. 30 minutes later, the 911 center received another call from that address. The same team of paramedics returned. It was right after you left. What confronted him was a very grotesque scene. An individual who had had his head beat in, who had vomited, and who had had a knife stuck on the side of his neck. With her husband lying in a pool of blood, Wendy insists she is the victim. We were fighting. He found out about my affair. He had a knife. He was threatening me. Wendy's defense was, yes, I killed him, but no, I did not need to kill him. It was simply self-defense. I'm sorry. He's gone. But he was still breathing. No one can understand why she murders either. Her husband would have died within weeks. This is one of the most baffling cases I've ever looked at. The incredible brutality she exhibited toward her husband as he was dying of cancer. Poisoning and then stabbing. No heart, no empathy. I can understand why she's on death row. December 23rd, 2004. Wendy Andriano is convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. She is currently on death row in Perryville Prison, Arizona. If I could ask Wendy one question, it would be, why? Why didn't you wait? Deadly women snapped. They left a trail of death. Amber Cummings shot her brutal husband to protect her daughter. Kate Webster killed and cooked her employer out of anger and greed. And Wendy Andriano bludgeoned her frail and ill husband because he took too long to die. These deadly women were prepared to kill when they reached their breaking point. Thank you for watching Investigation Discovery On Demand. Almost Florent Almas. Oklahoma Almas. So Thomas. Rogan Almas. Yuri Almas. Yuri Almas. Rogan Almas. Donna E. Almas. 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 Almost. 
Madonna E. Alamon, Alamon, Alamon. Somas. Alamon, Homus. Oklahoma. Homus. Rogan. Homus. Rogan. Homus. 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 Alamon, Donna E. Alamon, Homus. Alamon. Alamon. Somuri. Alamos, 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 Rogan, Rogan, Alamos, Donna E, Yuri, Rogan, Alamos, 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 Zogare, Rogan, Rogan, Oklahoma, Alamos, Donna E, Rogan, Oklahoma, Alamos, Homus. Zokon Ta, Rogan, 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 Zokon Ta, Rogan? Homus, Yuri, Rogan, or Homus? Donna E, Homus, Zokon Ta, Zokon Ta, Malamas, Zokon Ta, Donna E, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Rogan, Donna E, Isaac, Oklahoma, Rogan, Donna E, Homus, Homus, Malamas, Alamos, Omolare, Alamisa, Isa, Donna E, Isa, Alamos, 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 Donna E, Alamos, 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 Homus, 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 Rogan, Omolare.
Ook oh, klamma. Wat allemaal is. Sommers. 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 Rogan? Ook klamma. Sommers. Wat allemaal is. Sommers. Glory. Yuri. Glory. Sommers. Oklahoma. Sommers. Rogan. Alamaz. Sommers. Ice. 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 Alamaz. Ice. Alamaz. Sommers. Sommers. Glory, Rogan, Oklahoma, Alamaz, 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 Isa, Yuri, Sosomas, Sosomas, Alamaz, Homus, Alamaz, Homus. Sommers. Oklahoma. Wallemaas. Sommers. Sommers. Yuri. Sommers. Rogan. Oklahoma. Wallemaas. Sommers. Oklahoma. Wallemaas. Sommers. Oklahoma. Yuri. Wallemaas. 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 Sommers. Sommers. Wallemaas. Sommers. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Sommers. Daarna. Oklahoma. Alamas, Alamas, Rogan, Alamas, Oklahoma, Alamas, 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 Alamas,